head is pretty big. If you're caught up so far, you'll know that I previously went way outside of my comfort zone to build the guts of my first ever proper electronics project, a life-size Raspberry Pi powered BMO that controls my 3D printer with an Octoprint server. If you aren't caught up, then you can just go ahead and click that card and go watch the first part. I'll wait. <laughs> no, I won't. So electronics are out of the way. And that means it's time to design something I can 3D print to put all those delicate little electric morsels inside. But I don't want to just make any old BMO shaped box to dump a Raspberry Pi and PCB inside. I'm building BMOctoprint to be open source because I want everyone to be able to make their own which means it's time to implement accessibility design principles. Too much? What are accessibility design principles? Depending on the kind of design, it can mean different things, but at its core, it's about creating designs and products that can be used by as many people as possible. In this case, I'm designing something to be 3D printed and hand built. So the rules I'm following are, it must be easy to print, it must be easy to build, and it must be able to be completely disassembled. Far too many free models for 3D printing on the internet are a bit of a trash fire when you actually go to make them, either because they are incredibly difficult to print or poorly put together or not at all easy or intuitive to build. I'm going to do my best to do basically the opposite of all that. I may not have known exactly what I was doing with the electronics, but with this, I'm more in my element. Let's go do some 3D design. At the moment, I designed Infusion 360 for most of my 3D prints. To start off, I downloaded CAD models of the electronics components I use, where I could, to build around. I highly recommend it. It makes life much easier. Mind you, it's still a good idea to measure your physical parts. You'd be amazed at the differences in size of the actual piece compared to their official dimensions. Not even the file I brought in for the dimensions and layout of my PCB exported straight from KiCad was totally accurate. It was decidedly quite inaccurate. Double check your work, kids. I started with the faceplate and the buttons because that felt like a really important part to get just right. I test printed the pieces numerous times to make sure that the fit and functionality were good and consistent across the board. The buttons were designed to be printed in a hard plastic instead of a soft, flexible one, and so they work great with just this little inset to slot right onto the tactile switches. The D-pad was a whole other kind of challenge. I had to fit in with my design rules, obviously, but it also needed to, you know, not mash all the buttons at the same time. I tested a couple of different designs, but the winner ended up being this little screw-in 3D printed mount. It satisfied all of what turned out to be a rather long list of requirements to work properly. Sometimes the most effort goes into the smallest part. I regularly share progress shots and videos of exactly these kinds of juicy details on my social media. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone you weren't already following me if you go take care of it now. Once the button mechanisms were squared away, I bit by bit built up the rest of Bimo's body, which for the most part was quite simple and straightforward. In terms of general design and shape, BMO isn't terribly complex. But the beauty of this design isn't necessarily what you see on the surface. It's what's going on beneath it. Keeping the aforementioned rules in mind, I designed all the electronics mounts to not only take screws for easy installation and removal, but to print in an orientation that requires little to no supports. Additional mounting pieces have also been kept to a minimum, so there aren't a million tiny bits to print and keep track of. The specific print orientation was chosen for another good reason too, but I'll, I'll get to that shortly. What about BMO's side letters? I created them as separate pieces that are simple to print and will just press fit into the main body. No need for paint or a multi-material printer here. 
Supportless registration marks should make for easy alignment, and the walls all attach individually with M3 screws, making it pretty straightforward to remove pieces for maintenance or upgrades. Going around to the back, you can find one of my favorite design elements, the not remotely patented Beam Octoprint butt flap, complete with butt latch for effortless access and storage of BMO's accessories. Because that's where they go. It goes in my butt. Oh. This part is quite clever, if I do say so myself. To keep the latch from breaking when you use it, it prints as a separate piece from the flap, oriented on its side so the strain of squeezing it runs perpendicular to the layers instead of parallel. It then just slots into the flap using the provided gap here as leverage for pliers and voila! Functional U-shaped cantilever snap fit piece that's not a huge pain to print. These types of plastic joints are both really cool and surprisingly complex, so it did take a lot of testing to get the fit and tolerance just right. But I'm always all in for the good click. I know I might be making this all look a bit like a no-brainer, but the reality is that I did a lot of test printing to make sure everything worked as intended. Yeah, told you it's a lot, but it's an important part of the process. One I'm happy to be finished with. Speaking of part of the process, if testing is done, that can only mean one thing. It's printing time. At long last, all of my precious prints are finished. Be forewarned, this is not a fast project to print, not including the things I decided to print on my tiny 0.1mm nozzle, just to be fancy. All this took an accumulative 60 hours to print. The buttons and extra small parts added quite a bit more, but that shouldn't count because that's just me being extra. That said, there aren't actually that many pieces to this and they were largely very easy to print, keeping everything in line with my design principles. The build also requires a handful of M2, M3, and M4 screws to secure everything together, but otherwise, that's it. No complicated assembly, no niche tools, no big mess. All of the major body pieces I printed in PETG, taking full advantage of Polymaker's incredible trademark teal color for the body pieces. The buttons were printed in various PLA colors I had lying around, and the limbs were all done in Polymaker Polyflex 90A Shore TPU. I highly recommend PETG for the body, as it'll not deform around hot electronics, and its quite flexible strength is quite handy in these kinds of builds. Now, let's see if this is as easy to put together as I meant for it to be. I really wanted to give Beam Octoprint plenty of personality. Nani? So I had the idea of using flexible filament for the limbs instead of PLA or PETG. They're nice and bendy, but as you can see, they don't really tend to hold their own shape. Enter in armature wire. 
Armature wire is used in all sorts of applications to give puppets and sculptures a sort of skeletal structure that can, if desired, be bent and posed. I designed a channel in the print so I can insert the armature wire and be mocked to print could have fully poseable limbs. Cool, right? <sighs> Since I'm a slave to the aesthetic, I can't move forward until the limbs look just right. I feel like the color of the TPU is too close to the color of the rest of the body, so I want to tint it a slightly darker blue tone. I did a few experiments earlier with some refill Copic ink that I already had to hand to see if I could give the TPU a bluish tinge without changing the base color completely. I already knew from prior experiments that alcohol ink and 3D prints work really well together, but I wasn't entirely sure if I could create a tint with it. Fortunately, the right mix of ink and isopropyl alcohol gave me exactly the color I wanted. <sighs> now it's time for the real deal. No more practice. I've got my ink, I've got my IPA, I've got my paintbrush. I'm going in. I added in this little leg corner joint so that Bimok to print could sit easily without the legs having to bend in an awkward way. But it can also be removed with the legs in a standing position. There are also magnets in the hands so objects can be held at a later point. Remember how I mentioned there being a bonus in the print orientation I chose? All the outer faces lie in the print bed, meaning they're already smooth and shiny. It's very nice. Basically, I thought of everything. All of these fun details aside though, I think I can honestly say I'm pretty dang happy with how this all came out. Not only do I feel like I stayed within the boundaries of the accessibility design principles I laid out for myself, but the results also look so heckin' good. And it's big. Really big. But obviously, this isn't the end of the saga just yet. Bimoctorant has a body now, full of all the artificial neurons and inputs required to bring her to life. All that's left now is to put that life in... inside... No, I... What I'm trying to say is that I still need to do all the necessary programming for Bimoctorant's Raspberry Pi brain to actually make him do the things I want him to do. If you want to see the final installment of this build, then please feel free to avail yourself of the subscribe button right below this video and consider clicking the bell as well so you know when the next video is released. You know, as a strong suggestion. In the next Beam Octoprint video, I will once more be leaving the comforting embrace of 3D design and printing to travel to the strange and unfamiliar realm of Python programming. I'll be giving buttons purpose, connecting things to Octoprint, and we might even hear Bimo speak for the first time. For now, though, let us simply bask in the glory of one deceptively clever, aesthetically pleasing, hunkin' big BMO. Roll that beautiful BMO footage. Mm -hmm.